This is Dennis Ramundi. I'm here with my co-host, Phil Goldberg, author of American Veda. You're uh, on the podcast, Spirit Matters, spiritmatterstalk.com. Our guest today, Dr. Anthony uh, Bassas. He is uh, a, a PhD in clinical psychology and is the co-principal investigator at the New York University uh, Psilocybin Cancer and uh, Cancer Anxiety Study. That's one that he just uh, was uh, co-director of, and that's been finished up. Now they're going to do another study using psilocybin with uh, religious folk, as I understand it. Uh, uh, Tony, thank you so very much for taking the time to come on our podcast today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and speak to you again, Dennis, and to meet you, Phil. It's my pleasure, too. Um, maybe we can begin by uh, letting our uh, listeners know a little bit about you. And I'm curious, you're, you're a clinical psychologist. You have a private practice in New York. You're a professor at, at NYU uh, School of Medicine. Um, what got you uh, interested in doing research on um, psilocybin, which we should point out is a uh, LSD uh, in the vernacular, if I'm correct. Uh, well, it's not LSD. We, we can walk through the different med- medicines that yeah. promote these experiences, but psilocybin comes from the, from the mushroom. Um, it's the active compound in uh, mushrooms or in the street word, magic mushrooms, that have been around for millennia. Um, in indigenous cultures, actually pr- promoting spiritual experiences. Um, and we could certainly circle back to that. Um, my, my background, so uh, kind of a two, uh, two paths got me here. One, my own personal interest, lifelong interest in meditation and spirituality and comparative mysticism. Um, and the other track, I, um, I work in palliative care for many years, and one of the hardest part, um, uh, therapeutically, when working with an en- end-of-life patients, is addressing and mitigating that end-of-life distress. Um, and while palliative care has gotten better at, you know, targeted chemotherapies and pain control and their improvements in medicine, we still fall short of addressing that uh, spiritual or existential or emotional distress that we all could potentially face at the end of life. And there was a large body of research in the 50s and early 60s with psilocybin and LSD, uh, MDMT, other, other similar agents, um, and working with people at the end of life. Uh, and it reliably activated this mystical experience that we'll define and talk about today um, that's been known for millennia in humans. And that seemed to, or did, uh, reduce and um, help dramatically people at the end of life. So that was profoundly uh, uh, dramatic to to see. Um, So uh, our first study at NYU was using psilocybin-induced mystical experience with people, cancer patients, at the end of life or with Mm -hmm. severe anxiety associated with their cancer. So my approach is, my background is twofold, one from a personal interest in spirituality and also from uh, trying to find novel ways to help people cope with um, with dying, which is, uh, as you know, we don't do well uh, in America. Mm-hmm. You know, it's fascinating, uh, Dr. Bassas. I, I first became uh, familiar with your uh, research uh, uh, in, from a New Yorker magazine article, a very extensive article about what you were doing. So then I I interviewed you on my radio show before we did this interview that we're doing today, but I also uh, read a lot about it and actually even watched some this video testimonial from people that participated in the study. And uh, wow, it had a very profound effect upon people dealing with the deepest of anxieties, their own mortality. And also I know you've had a lot of success uh, in this area uh, with, with people with addictions and you're looking to other areas now. And so uh, my, my question is, uh, when you uh, conducted this first study with uh, people that uh, had advanced cancer, uh, were you surprised at the results that uh, you you got from those folks? <laughs> um, <laughs> probably a split answer. On one level, no, because I, I know the the prior research. I, I um, Hopefully, with the power of these experiences through the you know large body of literature, both psychologically and through the spiritual literature, so it made sense it would happen. But yes, as a palliative care psychologist, to see people come in with crippling anxiety uh, around their potential death and leave within a day or days following their session with that distress dramatically improved or even gone. 
uh, with an acceptance of their their death is incredible. So on one level, I was not so surprised, but as a clinical psychologist working with this population, it's incredible to see. So um, it's stunning. It, it's really, and um, we're hoping to uh, have additional studies down the road that will build upon those findings and uh, hopefully be a, a tremendous tool in working with people at the end of life. Uh, Tony, um, I'm really curious, and I'm sure we'll get into it, about the, the details of the study and to what you attribute these uh, dramatic findings. Uh, but first, so many, some of our listeners may be wondering how it is that you're able to do this research <clears throat> when um, the understanding is that uh, the, the compounds you're using uh, were uh, made illegal and, and out of the reach even of science for a long time. Right, so we should you take a step back and, and kind of uh, frame the conversation for the listener in terms of how we're using these. That's a great uh, starting point. Uh, so yes, the, these agents, these compounds, hallucinogens, psilocybin, um, and related ones like LSD are not uh, available for use therapeutically in this country. Um, they're scheduled where they're not allowed for medical use, uh, but the government has allowed them for these um, phase two research studies um, that allow certain sites, Johns Hopkins, NYU, UCLA, um, to investigate their efficacy with different populations, um, one being the cancer population with, with end of life, emotional distress. Uh, we're also working with people with alcoholism, um, there's been other clinical population. So these are controlled studies, um, and they're FDA approved, but correct, they're only in the research setting. And, and, and I, I do want to... Go, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to say, so we talk about these as drug studies, and the, the one thing I, I try to say each time I talk about this is that they're not drug studies per se. So what, you know, what does that mean? Um, the person in these studies takes the psilocybin once, um, and has this incredible, potentially incredible change. Most, me and it's, that's a very novel approach to uh, so-called medicine. Most medicine, uh, uh, antidepressant, Prozac, a heart medicine that you, someone could be on, works, gets a desired effect as long as the person's taken the medication. This is taken once, then there's this incredible change. So it's not the drug per se. The drug's actively, reliably, you know, opening this experience for the, for the client, for the subject, for the person. But the transformative experience comes from this altered state, what we call a mystical experience. It's been called the peak experience by Abraham Maslow, uh, numinosity by uh, Rudolf Otto, or the various language uh, to describe it, but it's the experience um, that's been known to humans for millennia that is a transformative piece that makes it so interesting. Um, the medicines out of their blood with a number of hours, yet the experience can be, can be life-changing. Um, so that's why these are called mystical experience research studies um, facilitated by, in this case, psilocybin. And let me briefly walk through the criteria of what, what a mystical experience is for those who are familiar with it. Um, it's our understanding, if you study religion, that the foundation of most religions is this mystic core, uh, this mystic foundation. And in terms of the research, there's a list of criteria that we use to measure if the person had a mystical experience. And briefly, those are uh, a sense of unity, a strong sense of interconnectedness with all things, all people, the world, um, the universe, a noella, qu noetic quality uh, coined by William James, a profound uh, insight or intuitive knowledge with ultimate reality, a sense of sacredness, a uh, deeply felt positive mood, uh, and, and very importantly, what, and I think one of the key transformative factors is the sense of transcendence of time and space, where the person transcends the, this current sense of being, um, and in a sense pulls the lens back on their life and sees beyond the body. So in the case of cancer, uh, the person has the capacity, and they have told us that they see, they, they no longer solely identify with the body or the cancer. They connect with some more enduring sense of self um, that's consistent with spiritual, of course, language, something more enduring, um, internal, and not just the body. Um, and that capacity to kind of 
uh, form some kind of non-attachment with, with the body or the cancer does seem to relieve them of some distress on that level as well. So, um, again, it's this peak experience that's so powerful, not just the medication by itself. Right. Uh, Tony, a question. Uh, so a person comes in, they, they get the proper counseling and in a very controlled environment, they have the uh, experience with the psilocybin. Uh, and then in terms of the follow-up, uh, do you then recommend things like meditation, like yoga, like other uh, uh, natural uh, means of, of a continuing or uh, attaining spiritual experience or enlivening spirituality in the person? It's a great question. We do, uh, and I always do. Uh, Houston Smith, the well-known theologian, once said, a spiritual experience doesn't make a spiritual life, or I'm paraphrasing him. Um, so these experiences can be very powerful, and then there's a sense of in, a series of integrative sessions. But we do recommend that when they leave the study to, um, ideally, if they, if they choose to, start a practice that allows them to connect or stay connected with that experience. And many people go on to do meditative a meditation practice or yoga. Um, I had one woman who left without any experience in meditation who went to a, a Zen monastery I referred her to, and she is now very actively involved in a, um, a Zen practice, which has been uh, very haunting to see. So, and, she, and she describes that as helping her stay connected to the transpersonal experience you had uh, on the psilocybin. So we do. Um, and as in a spiritual life, the initial experience it can be powerful, but it's what you do with it um, after that that seems to be important. So people do uh, report um, you know, living different lives. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Tony, in the uh, context of losing the fear of death, um, you, you refer to uh, finding uh, uh, or uh, perceiving a sense of self that's more than the body. Um, um, does um, uh, insight or uh, um, any kind of um, perception of afterlife in any specific way enter into it? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Some people have spoken about a continuation of consciousness. Actually, many people have, um, and that you know, part of their would help mitigate their fear was that consciousness continues, um, which of course raises the much larger question: What is consciousness? And that's <laughs> yeah, another, another kind of um, offshoot of this research. Um, you know, is consciousness solely generated by the brain, or is it what we call non-local consciousness, that it's outside biology, so to speak, and the ground of all being, and it never began, never ends, and um, that we tap into that somehow through our um, these brains and brains of ours. So some people do experience this um, unending consciousness that does provide tremendous re- provide tremendous relief. Um, in that sense. They've spoken about a continuation, not um, an afterlife per se of their current ego surviving, but um, a reduction in fear as they say this body isn't the um, the end. Uh, this body dies, but um, something continues. Um, so in that sense, yes, and that's been incredible to hear. And also this incredible sense of, you know, of all things we hear about is the sense of love they talk about. Um, mm. And many of the people I work with and have the most touching vignettes I've heard from these these people um, that are so poignant is them connecting with this incredible sense of love. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it seems to come across in, th- in three levels. One, a sense of love for themselves, loving kindness towards themselves and forgiveness um, as they um, approach the end of their life. A sense of enhanced love for those around them and for those who were in their life maybe decades ago who they haven't been able to forgive, but then they do. And which is incredible, this third dimension, so to speak, of a larger cosmic love or a spiritual love, or what I like to call a zapi from the Greek, um, that um, they tap into. And uh, actually, there's a, in the New Yorker article, one of the gentleman I work with who since passed away spoke about this over and over again, how that love transformed his death. Um, mm-hmm. And that's just been so incredible to hear. Yeah. Uh, Tony, uh, your new research it has to do with uh, religious leaders, a study at NYU with psilocybin with them. And my question is, uh, 
I have several questions. It's their area, but the first would be, uh, what type of people are you bringing in, in in terms of religious leaders, and what's the goal? What do you expect uh, or hope to find? So this is really exciting. So um, as you may know, 1962 was a very famous study called the Good Friday Study, right. mm-hmm. where Walter Penke uh, and others administered psilocybin to theology students uh, up at Boston. And they had, um majority had mystical experiences as defined by that scale I, I, read, I read to you before. Um, since then, no work has been done officially within uh, the religious community uh, until now. So um, us, I don't know, you'll know with Johns Hopkins, are starting uh, a new study, um, which is administering psilocybin to religious leaders. Um, since these states of awareness can be described in a spiritual nature, um, and every religion or path has a description of these states, or, you know, Samadhi, Kensho, Satori, Theosis, uh, Brahman, different words describing either the breakthrough experience or this ultimate reality. Why not have spiritual leaders, spiritual professionals, so to speak, um, be enlisted in this research to help us map out and describe this, this phenomena that um, people experience? Um, to see how they describe it. People have spent their life with a very unique sense of training um, in theology and religion to hopefully have a mystical experience um, and see how they describe it, which vernacular they use, how does it deepen or not deepen their practice, um, how does it help or not help religious understanding in their own path. Uh, so this is really exciting. It's a, a government-approved study. Um, it's a pilot study of sorts with only 12 subjects at NYU and 12 at Johns Hopkins, and we're hoping to get a diverse background. So well, well, priests, if I could, yeah, is from different priest, backgrounds, nuns, rabbis, rabbis uh, every every um, mm-hmm. tradition we could. So hopefully, um, people representing you know Buddhism, Hinduism, wow. Taoism, if we could, uh, of course, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. So if we can get leaders from each, um, it would be incredible. And we're just starting it now uh, this month, and uh, that's um, it's very exciting. Interesting stuff. Um, uh, with respect to the uh, earlier study with the, with the cancer patients, um, they knew they were uh, going to uh, experience psilocybin, right? They were going to take it. They did. They were a control group. There, there is a... No, no. So they, everyone got psilocybin and everyone got placebo. There were two doses. Ah. Um, they don't know which session was which, but they only did get it one of those two sessions. Um, so, yeah, they yeah. knew they were going to get still seven okay. one of those sessions. So there was some con- uh, some uh, control group kind of uh, setup with the with the religious leaders. Presumably, will that also be the case? What I'm getting at is um, a skeptic might look at your uh, and you probably had this and and ask about the role of people's expectations yeah. in in the outcome. Yeah, that's a good, it's an important scientific question. So. For all the um, foundational studies that, that has been going on recently with Hopkins, UCLA, and, and NYU, with cancer and other populations, there has been placebo, um, and it's met you know the most rigorous scientific um, you know, guidelines. And we're all we're publishing those that data um, within the next um, probably three to six months. It'll be published. So, of course, that met you know current and rigorous scientific you know. Um, uh, criteria. The religious leader study um, is a little different. Um, one, we're not measuring a clinical outcome. So mm-hmm. people with cancer, we're measuring cancer anxiety. People with alcoholism, we're measuring, of course, their capacity to stop drinking. Um, the study at Hopkins with people smoking tobacco with psilocybin to, to get them to reduce that, smoking cessation. This is really having them um, have the experience potentially and help us and um, describe this uh, incredible phenomenon known as mystical experience. So there is not going to be a placebo. There will be two doses, um, both of psilocybin. Uh, and, um, yeah, so uh, and they, and they'll know, of course, what they're getting before they take it. Well, if I may follow up, uh, Dennis, um, I think the reason I raise this is not just um, because it's an important scientific question, but it's also a, a, a spiritual or theological um, um, factor because th- there are people in the field of religious studies who um, attribute or uh, define and and discuss mystical experience 
in as in the context of cultural expectations. So, um, as opposed to uh, uh, validating the experience as a, as such, you know what I mean? As as if uh, that people uh, have certain expectations of what spiritual practices or what mystical experience is, and therefore um, the expectation produces just that experience. Right. But you're finding, presumably, that when people take the substance, uh, regardless of their expectations, there's a certain uniformity of experience. Right. So regardless of expectation and regardless of background, um, right. hmm. about half the people in the cancer study were, were um, either agnostic or atheists, and they still had this incredible experience defined by that criteria. Um, and although there's incredible differences within the exp- uh, across the experiences, there is that common core of, um, of elements, the sense of unity, transcendence, sacredness. Mm. Um, there's a woman in, in the cancer study, um, and I love to quote her on this, she was a and is a um, uh, self-described atheist. Um, she had a very powerful mystical experience, and I'm quoting her here. She said, um, and she described her experience, um, <coughs> this is actually a year later, after a while I started to feel love, just full of competency and love, and I felt that I was bathed in love. And you really think the only way to express this in our language is to say you were bathed in God's love. Well, I'm an atheist, so bathed in God's love is not what I want to say, but that really expresses the feeling. Wow. So it's it's so mm. I find that it's just so potentially interesting that, mm-hmm. and you know I know her still. She's doing wonderful actually in coping with her illness. Now she's in recovery and doing great. Um, but uh, language fell short, huh. which is one of the criteria that it's ineffable. It's hard to find words to describe mm-hmm. these experiences. Uh, but going back to your question, you feel yes they um. Uh, regardless of background, um, they have this this kind of central core experience. Hmm. Uh, Tony, uh, two questions. <clears throat> One is, uh, has anyone taken the psilocybin and then felt afterwards, I wish I hadn't have done this, had a bad experience or just wished, uh, felt it wasn't helpful, they, they wish they had not taken it? And number two, uh, was there anyone in the study uh, who couldn't tell the difference between the placebo and the psilocybin? So the first question is very important, and um, it's a good chance to point out that these studies that we've been running in, in, the, in this country, um, and overseas as well, there are other studies going on that are similar. The reason why there are no serious adverse effects, and there haven't been at all in, in our studies, uh, in our cousin studies at Hopkins and UCLA, is because of the way they're, they're used. Um, and that goes back to what we call set and setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, set is the mindset of the person, uh, setting is where it's done, and of course, intention, uh, what the purpose of doing this is. Um, for millennia, uh, there's good evidence these compounds were used in spiritual or religious rituals um, with an intention, with a certain kind of framework. In that framework, we've had we've had no we've had no adverse effects. Uh, well, well, no not even said, adverse. Tony, I mean, was there anybody that took it and said, "Yes, it was a life-altering experience," but? Uh, if I, if I had it to do over again, I, I would have uh, I'd rather not have had that experience. Yeah, no. Uh, conversely, everyone has, most, if not everyone, has asked for, to do it again, which is always very surprising to hear. So they would all say, can I do this again? And now, you know, we, we're speaking about people in their mm-hmm. 60s, never had this before, uh, and they said if they had an opportunity, they would take it again. Um, mm-hmm. So, but no one, uh, no serious adverse effects, and no one... Um, that I recall said I wouldn't do that again, although it was still helpful. And most had a powerful experience. Um, a very small number, uh, meaning one or two, had more limited or muted experiences, but most have um, some uh, psychological slash spiritual experience. Uh, and they vary in their intensity, of course. And, and they can tell uh, the difference between the placebo and the psilocybin in every case? Yeah, yes, except, except for one. Mm-hmm. Maybe, but, but we're going to publish that, so I don't want to get into the mm-hmm. into the data uh, set. Uh, Tony, um, you, since you quoted Houston Smith before, uh, one of the other things he said in this context was that um, altered states does not necessarily lead to altered traits. Right. W- what have you found with uh, with respect to changes of attitude, be it not just toward their own death or their illness, but in general in 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 behavior, 
and uh, relationships or any other factors in uh, people following the experience, or, or maybe you didn't look at that. That's a great question. That'd be a great follow-up for the religious study as well. Um, so we, um, when they finished the study in uh, months after their second dosing, uh, we did not follow them. And now I, I still know many of them, and I, they're doing wonderful, and they're living, uh, you know, I think fuller lives and with less anxiety. But um, we haven't officially tracked them ongoing. So, but it's you know, this is this research is really in its infancy again. Um, after uh, after decades of nothing being done, after a lot of research in the 50s and the 60s, we're just starting to get the ball rolling again. So that fills a great question for us, the ongoing research. Can we start to follow people ongoing after their research participation to see how it does, if it does affect their life in a, in a long-term way? And, and, and does it affect or, uh, uh, the uh, outcome of the illness itself? Yeah, that we don't think it will. Uh, ah. We we measured some small uh, measure of uh, of uh, their their health, but um, we didn't expect it to in this study. Um, uh, but it, it does raise a, a larger, more complicated question in terms of that field of psychoneuroimmunology. Can you know? Can we we know stress can affect disease process? Mm -hmm. So theoretically, if someone mm -hmm. had a mitigation of stress and um, you know, more fulfilled, and uh, would that affect disease process over the long term? Who knows? We, we're going to measure that. It's an interesting component question. Cancer is a very complicated, aggressive disease. And, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, these are great questions that, you know, we hope we're at the start of a new body of research investigating the use of these medicines that have such potential to explore consciousness, what is consciousness, um, to help people at the end of life, which we don't do well. You know, we don't die well in America. We mm -hmm. um, we don't talk about it. it. It's a taboo topic. Um, uh, and spirituality has been always talked about in certain ways. And this is a unique way to have, you know, maybe, maybe a common dialogue between different faiths about this um, common experience. So, and then there's studies with alcoholism, with tobacco smoking, um, so there's so much potential, uh, and it's very exciting to start this research again after decades of uh, not, not happening. Yeah. Dr. Bosses, uh, you, you've done the research now uh, on uh, uh, cancer patients. Uh, there's been work with uh, people with addictions. There's been work that's uh, going to start and has actually been done, as you mentioned, in 62 on religious leaders. Uh, what other groups would you like to look at? And uh, going into the future, what, how many steps have to be gone, uh, have to be taken before... Uh, you know, psychiatrists, doctors, psychologists can prescribe or make this part of a treatment program for folks who could benefit from it. Yeah, that's a big question. So, in terms of populations, I'm, you know, I'm really excited to do the religious study and, and hopefully work again on a new cancer study at some point. Uh, those are my two key interests, but mm -hmm. there really is, and people have brought up all types of uh, clinical populations from depression to uh, trauma. Um, and to, to many of the cohorts that could be helped. So, um, but you know, one step at a time. So for right now, the depression, the cancer, anxiety, the religious leaders, the addiction has been the focus, but clearly as we move forward, there might be other populations to, um, to benefit. Um, you know, when will this be rescheduled? Who knows? Um, but clearly these steps um, point towards a, a kind of a trajectory of, these, this data being published, uh, additional studies um, happening with cancer, anxiety, and could that, after that next phase, could that result um, in the FDA rescheduling these medicines at some point to be used in targeted populations with end-of-life distress? That's certainly hopeful um, in the hope of the patients we'd work with who all said that, and of course of the researchers. And are you um, looking at, or not looking at, or anticipating down the road um, that there would be implications beyond the use of these particular uh, compounds in these particular settings? Um, and might there be um, inferences for the use of other kinds of spiritual practices and, and so forth? And are, is there any concern that... Uh, when the word gets out that these su uh, substances have these positive impacts, that there might be a repeat of the uh, 60s when, you know, things got out of the laboratory. 
Yeah, so that's a concern of all of us, um, which is why these are tightly controlled and regulated studies within research settings. Um, you don't always get the same outcomes when not done in that setting. So it does concern us, um, and um, which is why we really can only speak about the, the, the way we do it in, the, in this research. Um, in terms of other populations, you know, people often ask, even in the New Yorker article, uh, could it be used for the betterment of, of all humankind, or however it was phrased. Um, you know, people can interpret that any way they like and, and see potential applications, but you know, as a scientist working within this medical model, I can only speak only about these studies, um, which are showing promise. So hopefully they'll be showing more promise in, in the next wave of, uh, of studies. But it's important for us, and it is crucial to really establish safety parameters. You know, how are these medicines used, uh, at what doses to provide safe outcomes. Um, and we're just starting this out, so it's really an exciting road, but um, it it's, needs to be done carefully within, the, I think, controlled environments. Are there any kinds of people for whom the, um, the, the compounds or the, the medicines are uh, counter-indicated? There are a fair amount to rule out you know, exclusionary criteria for that research, so people with who, who themselves or immediate family have uh, serious psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia or other psychotic spectrum disorders or um, uh, certain medical disorders would be ruled out uh, for safety reasons. So there are there are a fair amount of rule outs. Um, again, and, and people take these uh, outside of these settings may not know uh, their full medical history. Or right. um, mm -hmm. so again, the reason for these you know safe. Um, to, to monitor sentence, but there are a fair amount of rule outs. Right. Tony, uh, 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 where can somebody go to find out more information about the, the research that's being done? And also, I assume the work that's being done at Johns Hopkins and other areas that uh, the researchers are all in, in touch and in coordination in terms of what they're researching and what the, the plans are. We are. So uh, Johns Hopkins, UCLA, and NYU all Mm -hmm. uh, work uh, together in many, many ways and are all uh, funded and, and work with um, uh, a body called the Hefter Research Institute that helps fund uh, psilocybin research mm -hmm. in America. So um, I will um, provide you with a link, a uh, website link. Great. We'll you know, put that up you, on our um, podcast. That you could post. Um, the cancer study is completed, so the, um, the only current study I'd want to use is the religious study starting. So if there are uh, ordained priests and rabbis and other uh, leaders of religion who want to participate, I will send you a link for that. And of course, also our new um, study with psilocybin and alcoholism. And I'll, I'll send both to you that you could post uh, on your website. Great. You might get more applicants than you could uh, than you can accommodate. <laughs> if you I make. hope so. Right. Your lips to God's ears. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Phil, Tony, any, I any have a question for yeah. you. As a result of um, all your uh, research in this area, how does it affect your spiritual life? It's, it's very poignant and personally touching to witness these experiences, to sit in their room. Uh, and to watch someone for six hours uh, go into this experience um, and then come out of it and talk about what they experienced. Uh, and these are, you know, many people without religious training or spiritual backgrounds describing these incredible mystic experiences of unity and transcendence of eternal love. It's touching. There's no other way to put it. Um, and there's no way, it, it, you know, change. I mean, I, I've been changed by watching them. I've been. Um, it encourages me that we can die better deaths, um, not just with the medicine, but we have this capacity for meaning. You know, one of the, one of the larger questions, again, is, you know, are we wired for meaning? Um, and if so, why? Um, and it, it seems uh, pretty obvious um, that human beings are wired for, the, for meaning. We have this capacity for incredible states of consciousness mm -hmm. um, and for meaning-making. Um, you know, even at the end of life. So that is heartening to me as a palliative care psychologist and as just a person watching these people go through this journey, it's, it's, it's heartening to see this um, you know, mystic core of, of religion. Um, you know, religion is uh, in the news again these days and so much is going on with um, religious conflicts and 
but this is uh, this speaks to this you know mystic core, uh, this common ground uh, that seems to exist among most traditions. That um, is just um, yeah. So it has personally affected me. Um, and these people are so courageous. Our clients are so courageous to come in and do this. Um, and to watch them change has been very uh, transformative for me as well. Right. Tony, have you looked back, and I, I know that you're Greek, and your own uh, religious tradition, and, and, and seen uh, if there are mystical, uh, uh, historically there are uh, my- mystical traditions within your uh, religious upbringing. There are. Uh, in Greek Orthodox, there's a strong mystic core. Uh, and I, um, you know, I study uh, comparative religion. There are three that I've most been drawn to. One is of my, my religion of birth, so to speak, of Greek Orthodox uh, Christianity. And I've also studied Zen and, and Vedanta. And um, in each of those paths, is, there's a mystic uh, foundation, um, as there is in e- Eastern Orthodox uh, mysticism. Um, so... Um, and as a you know adult Greek now, I've really come to uh, uh, over the years uh, increasingly appreciate uh, my own heritage um, and the strong mystic path of uh, uh, of the Greek Orthodox. So yes, it has, um, and it's allowed me to revisit early writings and um, which all foundations have um, that are just um, strikingly similar too. When you study the mystic core mm-hmm. religions, you see this. Common thread, as, as Huxley called it, the you know perennial philosophy, mm-hmm. uh, running through the various religions, um, and that perennial philosophy, and um, described by many people, um, is, uh, is is strikingly similar, uh, despite some of the differences. So, um, you know, hopefully, this has implications for religious studies and and research into consciousness as well, um, in terms of what is again what is consciousness, and it's. I, I think kind of part of the final frontier of science. You know, right. what is what is this thing we ha- called awareness, and where is it? Um, mm-hmm. And can these medicines act as tools in exploring these incredible states of, mm-hmm. of consciousness? So, um, but yeah, I, I've um, I, uh, it, it has linked me. Uh, I mean, I've been strongly interested in Greek Orthodox religion, but it has uh, enhanced it even more so. Right, Doctor Bassus, thank you so much, Phil. Any final points from your side? No, I uh, I just want to be sure the listeners know we'll we'll be posting links if they want to right. look at the um, and and oh one other uh, Tony um, the the cancer study was published it's uh, the, can people read that if they have proper access to a scientific journal right so the cancer study the data from the Hopkins at NYU said are being published um, uh, so that will probably be re- hello. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in a medical journal, uh, it was in the next six months. So um, when that is published, I will certainly let you know. I could, in the meantime, send you other um, articles about the cancer research that you could post on your website. Very good. Great. Uh, and I also want to point out, people use the word psychedelic a lot, and hallucinogen. Um, sometimes not the most... Um, uh, most accurate description, but the new one of the new words we use to describe these medicines is called an entheogen, mm-hmm. um, which comes from the Greek word, you know, meaning becoming divine within or becoming God within. So it's interesting, even that word entheogen, uh, that many have used to describe these, um, mm-hmm. in addition to hallucinogens or psychedelics, um, has a strong spiritual, um, you know, dimension to it, uh, which uh, speaks to these uh, these you know powerful experiences. Right. Yeah, uh, and without the cultural baggage. Right. I mean, that's, you know, again, many people came into the study without any religious background. Um, yeah. And, um, look, you can describe these experiences in scientific or uh, religious terms. Uh, scientifically, incredible states of uh, openness and connectedness and um, pure consciousness. And um, But, you know, in, in my uh, experience, the, the scriptures from uh, Hinduism and, and Buddhism and uh, Christianity beautifully describe these states of consciousness as well. So why not keep that on the ball game as well? Um, mm-hmm. As Albert Einstein said, without religion, science is lame. Without science, religion is lame, or something like that. Where, you know, maybe ancient wisdom and modern science can come together to help describe this incredible phenomenon we call, you know, altered states of consciousness or mystical experiences. Right. Well, to- Tony, we we definitely want to uh, stay abreast of new developments in the research you're doing and have yourself and others uh, involved in your research on our show to follow up because I think it, it uh, totally uh, relates to spirituality and 
certainly contemporary spirituality. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Again, our guest today, Dr. Anthony uh, Bassas, uh, who is co-principal investigator at New York University and the work they're doing there on uh, psilocybin research. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure speaking to you. I look forward to doing that again. Thank you, Tony. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye.